What's up guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be diving on into Odd Realm. It's been about a year since we checked out this little colony management survival sim, and it's come a long way. In fact, pretty soon they're going to be releasing the third race into the game, which is actually why I'm revisiting the game right now, so that if you wanted to play in preparation for the releasing of the third race, which is going to have their own mechanics and things like that, then you'll be ready. If you've never seen Odd Realm before, Odd Realm is kind of like a minimalist pixel art colony survival game. It exists somewhere between Rimworld and Dwarf Fortress. And so I would actually compare it most closely to Nomoria. It's effectively Dwarf Fortress, but with like a lot of UI things kind of smoothed over. And then focused a little bit on kind of like storyline generating events like Rimworld. And so like if you took Nomoria and you kind of added Rimworld style events to it, I think you would have both the granularity and also the narrative capacity of Odd Realm. And I think there's room for that. You know what I mean? Like, for some people, like, I really, really, really like RimWorld. I think it's one of the greatest games ever made. But without mods, sometimes, you know, it's not quite as granular as what I want to bite into. It's not quite the Songs of Six or Dwarf Fortress or Nomoria adventure that I want to have with kind of mass micromanagement. And having a game that exists somewhere in between those two points, I think, is actually a very, very welcome change. So today we're going to play Odd Realm for about 25 to 30 minutes to see if it's something you wanted to add to your wish list or if it doesn't appeal to you. That's perfectly fine. You can pass on it. I'll have a link for you down below in the description. Now let's dive on in and see what we can accomplish here today. I am going to start a new game. I do have an existing game that I've played for about five hours. I feel like I almost said remind me, but then I remember this is recorded media. Uh, anyways, I do have another game that's about five hours in that I can show you some of the advanced stuff that's going on. We're going to start a new colony for right now so that you can see what the creation process looks like. And then probably for like the last five minutes of the video or so, we'll play my advanced colony. And I'll try to use that to kind of like illuminate any points that I may not have been able to show off in the early game start. Okay, let's go ahead and start a new game. So at the beginning of the game, the first decision that you've really got to make is you've got to decide what race you want to play. As of right now, as with the original release, there's only two races in the game. Uh, most of the development around this game has been basically just getting all the systems humming and moving, moving smoothly. And then at that point, they're going to start unloading more and more and more content into the game. But there is some new content in here uh, since the last time we played. There's humans, there's the ancients, there's the Arden. There's the Tomek, and there's the Gwadir. Most of these guys are not in the game yet. As with the last time we covered the game, humans and the ancients are the only ones in the game. The humans are pretty much like the standard RimWorld experience where, you know, you've got a colony of humans. They need to eat. They need to sleep. They need all of those, like, vital, primal things in order to stay alive. Uh, the alternate to that is the Ancients. They're effectively liches. Uh, they're people that have traded their humanity for immortality, and they consume, like, void energy or something like that, and they sleep in sarcophagi. Uh, basically, they've got, like, a little bit of a reimagining of the needs that a colony would need if it was run by a different race. And, in fact, I think that's actually a fairly compelling way to approach enlivening the game, I guess. Over here with the Arden, these are, I think, the geysers that are going to come out pretty soon. Uh, basically, they drain energy from living creatures, and then they use that energy in order to summon things like a lantern, like Green Lantern. And so, like, that's also, like, a really, really interesting, compelling angle. Like, I'm excited for these other races to get in here, especially, like, the Greenskins, dude. I'm always down for some Orc magic or, like, some Orc shenanigans. Uh, we got to name our realm. We're just going to go with humans for right now because it's going to make it easiest for me to show the game off. We've got to name our realm. Oh, I don't know. We'll call it Hangtoe. There we go. That's a good name. I just threw together two, like the first two things that came to mind. Now we've got to pick where on the map we want to live at. All of the map areas are going to have kind of like, I guess, different ratings. Uh, they can be dangerous. They can be kind of like chill. And in fact, they've kind of redone this a little bit, too, from what I recall. Like, in the old days when you were selecting a place that you wanted to live at, it would actually tell you how risky the area is. Like, and how many, like, raiders and bandits and things were around. I don't know if it does that anymore. There's the Cutthroat Meadow over here. That's kind of cool. Huh. Well, we'll go for... I really, really like the idea of this little taiga right here. Like, we can probably go like right along the coast or maybe on this little like jetty right here let's just go right there apparently cats were sighted right here that 100 percent means that we have to take this spot because what could be better than kitties uh you're also gonna get to pick your loadout this is very very uh i guess reminiscent of 
This is very reminiscent of Dwarf Fortress. Uh, you get to pick whether or not you wanted to start out basically with a band of pioneers that have like a bunch of varying skills. You can decide if you wanted to start out with warriors who may not have like equitable, marketable survival skills, but they're really good at fighting and defending themselves. You can start out with one lone settler living off the land and go with kind of like an unreal world angle to the game. Or you can go custom and you complete you can completely design your own start and all the items that you want to bring with you and all the characters you want to bring with you. I think it uses like a point buy system from what I remember, but it's been a while. We'll go with the pioneers real fast. Indeed, the pioneers are pretty easy. Uh, so if you are looking for more challenge, I would definitely go with one of the other starts. But we've got to name our settlement. Uh, we'll just name it Buttfjord. There we go. That's a fantastic, that's an old classic name right there. I think it comes from Shakespeare. Uh, let's go ahead and we will depart. Okay, so we're on the game map. The load speeds in this game, very, very quick. But then again, graphically, the game is not... It's kind of like, I, I was going to say graphically, the game is not much to write home about, but that's actually patently false. This game uses a minimalist pixel art style, but it's very, very clear that whoever does the art for this game really knows what they're doing, because there's like these little details in the minimalism that a less experienced artist would not be able to put in. And, and so anyways, it becomes one of those one of those conversations about the classical masters versus the people that have mastered stylization and whatnot. Uh, but I believe that whoever does the art for this game is kind of in the latter category. Like there is definitely skill involved in stylizing something down to like bare simplicity, but also being able to com imply complexity from that simplicity. If you get what I'm saying, it was kind of like a hell of a sentence and now I feel pretentious. Uh, we better decide where we want to start out. We can zoom out by holding down control and using the mouse wheel. This is a nice little strip of beach. We've got lots and lots of flat land over here, so it should be easy to grow into. And in fact, I'm excited to do so. We do have some deforestation that we're going to need to take care of. I'll probably knock out this chunk over. Either we'll live up here or we'll live kind of like on this strip. Although this spot also seems acceptable because then we've got easy access to stone too, which some kind of, it can sometimes be difficult to like get after. Now this game does use the same elevation system as Dwarf Fortress. Using your mouse wheel, you can scroll upwards, and as you can see from this little meter right here, this is taking me higher and higher into the sky, and then you can also go down Z levels into the earth, like so. And good things and bad things are going to be deep down beneath the surface, and you're going to have to figure out how to rectify with those things. But these little guys right here are trees, uh, so we do need to chop down some of these to give us some baseline materials so let's go ahead and put our town center like right there that's fine by me and as you can see we've got our villagers we've started out with five of them we've got let's go let's go through the list we've got dean nim fiala jane and zara apparently we've got a carpenter a farmer we've got a lumberjack we've got a miner and we've got a stonemason not too bad of a start we may need to reassign someone to go and do like mining tasks but that should work for right now, I think. Uh, at the moment, what I would like to do is we need to chop down some trees. So we're going to go to our jobs menu over here. We're going to grab the logging skill. And we're just going to tell them to kind of log out some of that stuff right there. And what you should see is the guy that's enabled to be a lumberjack. He's going to actually like actively get after that and go take care of it. The game does use a job-based system. And it's actually kind of an interesting way that they've arranged the game. And it all makes sense in retrospect. So like when I was initially doing my thoughts on this game. And I was playing for like four or five hours prior to this video there was a number of times where I was like why is the UI designed the way that it is like it would be easier if just like this and this and this and you would save clicks here as you get further on into the game you start to realize that it's all linked and in fact the UI has to be designed the way that it is in order for it all to kind of like function well basically every single character has a class they have a job that they do and inside that job we'll take uh, Dean for example uh, Dean is a carpenter and so Dean has a bunch of skills down here. In fact, he can do, I think there's, let's see, there's three layers of eight skills minus one. So there's 25 skills in the game. Everything from hauling to fishing to casting magic to fighting, so on and so forth. Now Dean is a carpenter. If we find the carpenter on the list over here, he's a level 10 carpenter. 
but he's also got XP on his little character sheet right here. So as he does activities, he's going to level up. Now in RimWorld, as your character does stuff, they slowly level that individual skill up. In this game, your characters are like RPG characters, and whatever job they are assigned, when they level up, they will gain skill in that job and like the associated skills with that job. They don't gradually level up like a RimWorld character. They level up by, like, leaps and bounds whenever they level up. And so that's a thing to be aware of. In addition, you can enable and disable jobs uh, from this menu right here. Everything that's got, like, a circle around it is something that they're okay with doing. And everything that does not have that is something that is disabled. As of right now, there's probably a pretty good chance that we're going to have people that have very, very poor overlap in skills like it, it's a good possibility that we may just have some people that can't do certain things and we'll just have to deal with that until our first group of immigrants i'm going to start taking this mountain down we're going to use this basically as our own personal quarry uh it's a very it's a blessing in this game to have stone nearby they don't need to have tools or anything they can do these jobs all by their lonesome later on we'll be able to craft tools using bronze and iron and steel and all that kind of stuff as we move through the tech tree and it will make them much much more effective at doing their jobs but everybody is assumed to basically have a baseline tool that they use to do their job regardless of whether or not you equip it on them in the inventory screen and we did get some stone chunks right there that's nice we've got wood up and running let's go ahead and we're going to start building some domiciles here i don't know what blocks we have available to do that it looks like we only have wood log walls right now so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to make a bunkhouse i would like for this to be kind of a Honestly, I think a 7x7 seven seven kind of works for a bunkhouse. Like, I was going to make a longhouse, basically. Why have I done this? I'm doing stupid things again. There we go. I don't know why I decided to do that. Like, I looked at it, and I did it. I made basically a solid block of walls right there. Apparently, my brain is not firing on all cylinders right now. Uh, they will get to work, and they will... Oh, that's up in the air. Hold on. i got to redo it. I've got that on the wrong Z level. We'll go ahead and get rid of you. There we go. I got to get this to the proper Z level. There it is. Okay. I'm not good with Z levels. I have always just been really, really bad at managing my Z levels. So there's our longhouse. Now it's actually on the ground level, and they're going to go ahead and build it. Uh, one of the first things you're probably going to want to do in this game before you get, like, full-on chugging is you're going to want to go to your Saga overlay. The Saga overlay is a new addition. This was not in the game the last time that I played it about a year ago. And this is effectively the way that your characters advance through the tech tree and move through ages. So you start out kind of in the Stone Age, and then you go to, like, the Bronze Age, and then you go to, like, the Iron Age, so on and so forth. Uh, but basically up at the top right corner, you've got various books. Where do these books come from? Well, when you've got a colonist that's assigned to a job, every job is assigned to kind of like a greater nebulous of tasks that are either industry, cooking, agriculture, arcana, or war. And anytime they do a task that is considered to be part of one of those schools, they have like a percentage-based chance to poop out a book, which basically represents that this person has taken the time to write down their knowledge because this game takes place over multiple generations. Your characters will actually have children and they will die of old age and things like that. And because it takes place over multiple generations... People write down their knowledge so that their children can know how to do carpentry or their children can know how to do blacksmithing. And, and I guess kind of the conceptualization of that idea is that these books are traded in for technological advancement. Uh, so we've got two industry books right now. I would recommend that we research woodworking uh, because that's going to give us 30 new blueprints to play around with. We also have a cooking book. I would suggest that we just spend that right now. There's literally nothing else to spend it on, so we might as well. Uh, we also have one agriculture book. The agriculture book is going to allow us to plant trees. It'll also allow us to plant crops, I think. Actually, I think we can already plant crops. Uh, so the what does fishing one do? Oh, it gives us the fishing pole. That might not actually be a bad idea. I don't think we have a fisherman, though. Let's go ahead and we will make a... We'll get wells first. Having access to kind of like potable water, I think, or potable water, is a good idea at the beginning of a society. Now that we have our well blueprint, I think we're in really, really good shape to get our water taken care of. And all the really important resources are going to be listed up top along here. We've got 22 drinks. We've got no cooked meals right now. We do have raw food, though, which is good. And we should be able to forage around as well. I actually don't know exactly what we're going to have around here. Let me take a zoom out and look. There may be some berry bushes and things that I can get down on in this area. 
before too long. Actually, not a lot of forageables around here. Somewhat surprising, so we may want to lean into the fishing angle then. There's a void crystal over there. Not that important for us, but definitely important for the liches. Uh, yeah, it doesn't actually look like there's a lot of things to eat around here, so... One of the things that we're, wanna get a, that we're gonna wanna get on top of, like, really, really quickly, in fact, is going to be a farming area. Uh, so let's go ahead, and we'll put in, like, a farm right here. We'll put in, like, a little farm right here, and a little farm right there. And maybe a little farm right there. I don't know if we're gonna end up using all of them. But, we do have our little farm zones now. In fact, I actually don't even think we need the farm zones. You can just plant individually. I haven't really wrapped my head around how the farm zones work just yet. Uh, like, so, I played around with it for like three or four hours, and I couldn't seem to find a way to get them to automatically plant a certain crop in a certain field and to harvest it and then to replant afterwards. So, I've just been planting like independently on my own whenever I need food. And, like, I, I guarantee that somewhere inside the game, this system exists. However, there are not a lot of guides. There are not a lot of resources for this game. Uh, there are not a lot of things out there to help you get started. And so, because the game has such a busy, like, granular UI that's got things going on everywhere, it can be a little bit of a challenge. So, I'm just going to plant manually for right now. And we'll put in a couple of fields right there. The good news is, planting manually means that this is going to be very, very organized and easy to keep track of. And so what you will see is that if we have someone that's actually enabled to go farm, which I think is probably this individual right here, yeah, so Nim is going to go over here and start planting crops. Uh, we also need a storehouse. We need, like, a place where we can put all of our things uh, so that we're not, like, all cluttered. Because as you can see, there's a lot of stuff laying around. There's, like, little seeds. We've got, like... Myrtle grass just kind of laying around over here. There, There's like other carrot seeds and things. There's like jars of water. There's books. This is chaos, and I cannot stand chaos inside my society. So we need to get on top of this, and we need to make a storage room. I'll probably just make a really, really big one. Like a so. There we go. And actually, I think because we unlocked carpentry, we now have doors as well. So we'll put some doors in there to make it look a little bit nicer. We're not going to be able to do floors just yet because we don't have a lumber mill. We will have a lumber mill soon. In fact, I can actually pre-prep pre for the lumber mill here if I go kind of like up like this. Yeah, that'll work. There we go. And we'll just have the lumber mill off the side uh, effectively of the storeroom. We'll put another door right there so it's got easy access from the front. And as you can see, they're all going to get to work. One thing I have been enjoying about this game is I feel like the idea of colony survivals with like mental breaks has become really, really pervasive in colony survival games. Like it's just become one of those games that like every single colony game has, regardless of whether or not the gameplay of the game actually needs it. I will say this, it is a breath of fresh air to play a game where I don't have to worry about somebody mass murdering the entire colony in a stupefied, drunken, slurring rage uh, because they got rained on after they ate without a table. That's pretty nice. Like, it's just one of those things that's become so tropey about the genre that I think I'm kind of, like, done with it. And its absence actually makes me kind of happy in this case. Uh, it looks like down here on this sea level, I put a guy to work. Uh, starting to mine away, and the reason for that is that we need dirt, because we're gonna make clay roofs. I could make shingled roofs, or I could make hay roofs, but the hay roofs can get kind of, like, expensive. Like, they take a lot of plant fibers. And so anyways, let me see how many plant fibers I've got laying around before I do this. Uh, we've got like 39 of them. I guess we can get started with it. We'll have even more after the harvest, too. Oh, that's on the wrong level right there. I am once again screwing up my Z levels. There we go. We want it to be right there. Perfect. All better. I almost made a catastrophic error and converted the entire floor plan of my house into thatching. As you can see, our farm has been planted. You can see the little seeds in the ground right there that have all been laid out. I've got people destroying grass right now in order to get me some more grass fibers so that we can finish off this roof. So as you can see, they're clearing the ground cover over here, which is just one of the easy tasks that the game has enabled by default. I've actually got it set up through here, and you can see the little area that I'm going to be kind of tearing all the grass out of, I guess, for thatch. Actually, we've only got eight drinks left, too, so we should probably get to work building that well. I think it's going to be in the props menu. Yeah, there we go. 
we've got enough stone chunks. So let's just go put it kind of in the center of town right there so that we can gather water out of it. It looks like our miner just got done taking the entire top level off of this mountain, so we should have enough stone to get the well done so that we can pull up the goodies. Uh, this little field is still being stripped out down here. It did generate a tome of agriculture, which is really, really nice for us. And our farmer, who is doing this kind of removing the grass job, has leveled up like three times doing it. So it's not the worst thing. Foof! We finally caught up with you. We've got a ton of food to spare. Do you have room for us? Uh, yeah, sure. We could use more villagers. Let's get to work. Absolutely. Uh, so there is our first crop of immigrants. We've got five people that wanted to join our society. It doubled the size of our colony. Uh, the most that I've got right now in my, my big city is I've got like 20 people or 25 people or something like that. I haven't gotten too much further than that in the three or four hours, but you know. I was working on it. Now, we need to designate some rooms. I want this to be the wood mill over here. And every single room that you designate is going to tell you things that it needs. So this needs a fire pit, a furnace, and a workbench in order to function properly. Uh, so let's go ahead and find those things in the prop menu. Uh, there's our fire pit. So we'll go ahead and place that right there. We also needed a workbench. We'll go ahead and place that right there. And then the final thing that we needed, I think, was a furnace and I actually don't think that we have the furnace yet unlocked I think we need to have stonework in order for that to function yeah so we'll go ahead and spend some industry tomes in order to move that along and then now that we've got it unlocked uh, the furnace should be right there there it is uh, we'll put a furnace in on that side there has been a lot of refinement to the crafting system in the game I can remember distinctly in the earlier builds I was not a huge fan of the way that like the workshops and everything functioned but it has been refined on coming back I'll, I'll tell you that was the part that I was dreading relearning the most is all the workshop functions and whatnot but honestly once you figure out sort of the way that the UI works for the crafting you'll be okay it's just you gotta kind of like this is one of those games that you're going to have to chew on the UI a little bit in order to understand how it works. And I think it'll be a little bit easier if you've played Dwarf Fortress or if you've played Nomoria before because the game's interface flow seems to be very much, I, I think, inspired by those two games. And, and so anyways, it'll be easier. But if you've never played a game like this before, it's going to take a little bit of work before you can figure out how everything functions in inside the complete package. So our workshop is done, actually. That's really, really good because we need to start manufacturing things. So we want to go to the production tab over here. We're going to add a new job. And really what I'd like to do is I'm probably not going to mess around too much with wooden tools but because we already have stone technology. So stone tools are more than likely going to be the first thing that we want to spend a bunch of time crafting in order to equip everybody. But what I do want is I do want to set up an order for planks. And if there are less than 25 planks, keep making planks. In addition, I would also like you to manufacture coal if we have less than 25 coal. So those are the two kind of like principally important jobs for our society that need to get done no matter what. Uh, the other thing is that we're finished inside of here. I think what I would like to do next, are you guys still just like hanging out on the roof? I guess they must not have any other jobs. What do they do? So we've got a sheep farmer. We got a stone. Well, we already had the stonemason. We got a tailor. We got a warrior. Oh, that's very, very nice. Okay. We've also got a tanner. We've got a laborer, and I think that's about it. Uh, let's go ahead and let's take this on over to the skill permissions, and I'd actually, we, we're not going to have a tailor for a while. Tailoring is pretty far down the list. So, what else are you good at, Taylor? Uh, you're good at mining, you're good at lumberjacking, you are okay at cloth working, I guess that makes sense. You're decent at research, you are okay at fighting, actually. How about farming? Decent at cooking, although we're not going to be able to cook properly until we get to, like, the, the Bronze Age. But still, decent at cooking. Not, not bad at cooking. For now, I'm going to enable you to be a miner. And I am going to enable you to, I think... Cook. And that should be fine. We'll just kind of like, I was going to set up a new class for her, but I'm not going to set up a new class for her. I'm just going to let her like do her thing. The other thing we need to do is we need to set up our stockpile down here. Uh, so we need to go to the rooms menu and we need to go with stockpile 
and we'll just call that a stockpile right there. And hopefully I got that on the right Z level. Now this game does have containers, and so I do highly recommend that you use containers. Otherwise your stockpile is gonna fill up really, really, really quickly. Uh, we've got bins. Bins are great for things like resources, seeds, refined materials. We've got a cabinet for gear. Uh, so I'll probably go like two cabinets for gear right there. I'll probably go like maybe a couple of bins, I guess, over on that side. We'll put in a couple more bins, a couple more bins, and then we'll just kind of fill out the rest of it, I think, with crates. There we go. And hopefully between all of these different storage mediums that we have, we'll be able to store up a lot of our nonsense. As you can see, everybody's flying along. I don't know why, but I find this game to just be utterly... Oh yeah, people need water. Human beings like water. I totally forgot about that. Okay, well, first and foremost, let's just set up some water gathering jobs down in the water over here. There we go. Uh, so that they go do that before people start dying of thirst. And then as I recall, I think we just set this up as a well house right here, uh, as a room to get them to draw from it. And if I remember correctly, you can just go over to here. Yeah, and then you, you have them draw water from the well, basically. Uh, so we'll say if we have less than 25 water... Draw water from the well. And as you can see with the job that I put down here, they're going to climb down the bank, and they're going to go down to these water collection spots that I've set up for them, and hopefully get some of the goodies out of there. Now, I am aware of the fact that this is the ocean, and for some reason we're able to drink out of it. I, I do think that the ocean should be nerfed, basically. Like, it's, it's honestly, it's so easy to get a well in this game that making all of the water salt water along the borders of like the oceans and whatnot so that you can't draw and drink from it honestly won't really affect the flow of gameplay that much anyways i don't even think you could reasonably call it a nerf it would be basically just be like an immersion booster uh, i do want to gather these berry bushes actually that are sprouting up around here oh our crops are growing and nice this game has kind of like a weird conceptualized version of farming uh where all of your farming happens inside of like three days it doesn't take that long to grow crops so with our water problems officially taken care of don't mind the damage numbers every single activity in this game involves your character punching an object for damage he's not damaging the well like the damage number popping up when he smacks the well to work on it i don't know dude he, he's unleashing the beverages of rage i i, I don't know uh, we do need to set up a house for people to live in as well and we should have planks ready to go for the flooring inside of here. In fact, we do. So let's go ahead and get the plank flooring put in. I would also recommend slowly getting the plank flooring done in all of these localities as well. There we go. So that's going to be a big job. It's going to take them a little while to get that finished off. But the props that I want are going to be for my bedroom over here. Oh, that was not what I wanted. You can just get rid of a construction by right-clicking. And in fact, we don't have enough beds. Uh, we're still going to need... That's eight beds right there. We're going to need two more beds in order to make this whole thing function. I also have not figured out how to assign bedrooms. I assume that that function is somewhere inside the game, but I haven't gotten there yet. Like, I know how to play the game and I can get far into it, but I get the feeling there's a lot of minutia, and I get the feeling that there are quite a few like smaller activities and like smaller UI implementations that I have just completely and totally missed out on. Like it feels very much like there's a menu or something that I have just played this entire six or seven hour period uh, with this game and completely neglected and not been able to find. On the plus side, the beds are up, they will hot rack, and if there's beds available, they will now have children, uh, which is important because you need replenishment in this game. Your people will die of old age, and so you need people to replace them, and there will be, like, interesting events that spawn from that happening as well. Uh, like when an old warrior dies, for example, and passes on their knowledge to a younger warrior, or, or things of that nature. And, and so there are some, some pretty cool sort of generational mechanics in this game that seem to become apparent as you get further and further on in. For right now, I doubt that anybody wants to sleep in the rain, so we may want to put in some kind of roofing over here. We don't have enough to do a thatch roof, but we do have dirt to make a tile roof. So we'll go ahead and we'll make like a, a tile roof real fast. And they should be able to mash that out 
pretty quickly in the interim while we wait for all the planks for the floors to get done. Uh, he is stacking up a lot of planks over here, so I think that'll get done pretty swiftly. We're probably going to want to put in a secondary housing area as well, but I would prefer for this mountain to be down before we go any further than that. Let's go ahead and I'm going to set them up to mine over here because I very much like the idea of having kind of like a cobblestone road that runs through town in order to make this all function. Oh, multiple people are enabled for mining now. Cool, so I guess they must have had it on their, their skill sheets because now we've got a lot more supplementary help in tearing down this mountain. And what I'd like to do, actually, is over on this side, I'm going to install a stairwell, basically, so that they can get down to the lower level and they can start getting deeper down into the earth, basically, in order to get at the good stuff. You know, things like coal and copper. You can see some coal peaking right here. I don't know if I saw copper or anything else anywhere else on the map. But there should be some tin. Oh, yeah, there's a tin vein right there, it looks like. There's some tin right there. There's some tin and some copper over here. And those are actually fully exposed, like, on the surface. And so it looks like we're about ready to go up to the Bronze Age. Everything has been appropriately taken care of. Our roofs are on. We've got our first little bunkhouse. I'll probably put another one down here while we wait. Just like a little 7x7 seven seven that everybody can grow into. Let's find these walls here. We could actually do plank walls now, too, if we wanted to. It'd make it look nicer, but it'd be harder on our supply, I guess. Uh, let's go down by, like, seven. We'll get six right there. We'll get another seven right there. We'll go like so and like so. And then we will drop in a door. And as you can see, they're going to spring to work and get that done. We are going to have to harvest some more trees. That's fine by me. I'm not that concerned about chopping down trees. This map seems to have a lot of wood-related resources. My last map, I had to run all my own tree groves. One of the, It was a weird map because my first technology that I had to take was the ability to create orchards uh, simply due to the fact that there was, like, no trees on the map. There was, like, ten trees on the map. I chopped them down, and I got, like, ten seeds, and I kind of had to work from there creating an orchard in order to solve that long-term problem right bright and early. And I like it when playthroughs have interesting issues like that that need to be resolved. There we go. And then we'll take this up by a level. We'll go over to the roofing menu. And hopefully, I don't think we're going to have enough clay to get that done. So I think I am going to have to send the miners back down into the clay mines in order to acquire further clay. So we'll go ahead and just open up two new shafts down here, and they'll get to work on it. This will also act as a supplementary source of stone, too, for when we decide we want to put in, like, cobblestone floorings and things of that nature. Uh, the next thing that I would like to build is I would actually like to set up a job. Let's go ahead and knock down all the trees over here, because I'm going to put the, the stoneworking workshop right here uh, so that we can start making stone tools, which should raise their damage by about 50%. With a stone axe, you should be hitting for about 15 instead of 10, and so it'll probably reduce the amount of chops he needs by about three and make them a little bit more effective at getting that done and this is also generating agriculture points uh, and helping people level up at their tasks so i think it'll work out pretty well we'll slow the game back down looks like we've got some more water that's being pulled out of the well we also have a number of crops up here that manually are ready to be harvested so we'll go ahead and grab those just to keep the food supply nice We've got a couple of carrots that are grown on in, but I'm going to wait for the entire harvest to get finished off before I go too wild and crazy with it. Uh, the good news is, in this game, it seems like most plants replace themselves with seeds. How many seeds you get seems to be somewhat random, but you always seem to get one when you take down a crop, so you don't need to really worry too much about running out of agricultural resources, which is a nice little load off. Like, I don't think that this game is meant to be as intense as something like Dwarf Fortress or RimWorld, where there's constantly, like, this outside existential threat happening that you need to deal with. Uh, it's meant to be a little bit slower paced of a colony manager. That's not to say you won't be invaded by bandits, and you won't get into fights, and you won't have other problems, but just my experience with the game so far has been that you don't get attacked that much. Like, I think in the four or five hours that I've played the game, I don't actually think I've been attacked at all. Like, I think I was mostly let alone. Like, there was a threat at one point, like my map got invaded by snakes, but they spawned in beneath the surface in a cave, and so I just left them in there until they starved and I didn't have to fight them. There we go. Get some of those gooseberry seeds up right there. The carrots are ready to go. Let's go ahead and harvest those off. That'll help out with the old food supply. 
And then we're going to want to put in a few more crop rows. Hey, another Tome of Agriculture. Nice. You love to see it. Society is advancing. So now that we've played the game for a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and swap on over to my big colony so that you can see what that looks like and see kind of like what further on gameplay in the game looks like. Let's swing on over there. So this is my big colony right here. It's not that much larger than what we've all got going on already, but I've basically got like these little houses right here and they've all got beds in them. We've got 17 people at the moment. I've got this crop plot over here that's supplying us with basically endless food. I've got a kitchen in the middle that's got a brass cauldron for cooking. I've got my woodworking and I've got my masonry area over here. This is obviously the communal storehouse. Uh, we've also got a blacksmithing area, so we've got forging right here, and we've got smithing because this group is in the Bronze Age. Yeah. If you take a look through, like, my character sheets here, let's let's find somebody so that I can show you what they've got going on. Uh, let's start with a blacksmith. So we've got Axel Byron. There he is. Open up his inventory. As you can see, he's got himself a bronze hammer that I crafted. It can be used as a weapon, and so that does 5 to 12 damage. He's also got his offhand default tool for 5 to 8 damage. They've got clothing. You can customize by job what equipment people wear. So you can make sure that everybody you assign to the warrior role will automatically go pick up breastplates and they will automatically go put on kind of like leggings and kind of, I guess, like uh, sabatons and things of that nature. If you've got somebody that's a farmer, you can set them up to have normal clothing and always equip like a scythe. And in fact, I do have those presets done here. Those presets are finished on off. In this society, I think I only really have one warrior. And you can see her over here. She's training on a training dummy. But she's getting pretty good at it. I'm not going to lie. She's got 25 in melee skill right now. And so while right here it says that she only does 1 to 6 damage, her hit chance is through the roof. And in fact, what I'm working on with this character right now, or with this colony right now, is I wanted to get up to creating... Uh, weaponry and so anyways I do have some tomes of war we'll go ahead and take the tomes of war right there that's brought us up to stone melee weapons the stone melee weapons I'm gonna have to find them I assume that it's gonna be the masonry shop that produces these but it looks like we've actually got a stone longsword in here we've got stone swords I would recommend making one of those so let's go ahead and make a stone sword real fast and then if we have a stone sword that also means that I can actually utilize a shield. So we can go over to the wood mill and we can add a job to make a wooden shield. Uh, and we'll get her re-equipped before we close out the episode so that she's got better weaponry. Uh, the other option that's available to us here in the Saga menu is we can't... Hey, Saga menu. What are you doing right now? There we go. Saga menu. For two, I can make stone armor, but that just gives us a stone shield. I think our first actual batch of armor is going to come once we get into bronze, basically. Uh, but you do have different categories of weapons you can make here. There's bows, there's arrows, there's spears, there's javelins, there's adlatels and slingshots. Uh, there's actually a pretty good variety of, of, like, weapons, basically. Like, there's lots and lots of things that you can, you can throw at the enemy should you desire to do so. I actually, my dad and I, one summer, we made a set of adlatls. If you don't know what an adlatl is, the adlatl was the dominant form of hunting in prehistory, uh, like in the Stone Age. Like, almost every single culture across the world figured out the adlatl. And basically, all that it is is it's a stick that you hold in your hand with a notch on the end of it, and then you make a whole bunch of, like, two-and-a-half, three-foot spears. And the spear goes into the notch... And you hold it between your fingers with the spear on top, kind of like chopsticks, and the throwing stick underneath. You wheel it back, and what it does is it produces centrifugal force so that you can actually... I think when we measured it, after a couple days of practicing, this is not a hard weapon to wield. It's actually really easy to figure out. Uh, just about anybody can use an adlatl if they practice for a couple of days. Uh, after two or three days of throwing spears with our, our homemade adlatls, we were able to throw them about the length of a football field. Like, you get pretty good at it. And honestly, if you, like, point your finger when you throw, it will go exactly where you point it at. Like, it is a incredibly simple yet sophisticated yet really, really contextually easy weapon to manufacture and figure out how to use. And so it makes sense that so many people all over the planet had it. I don't know. I'm a little bit of an ad ladle enthusiast. I'm sorry. I just, I, I get a little bit excited about the prospect of ad ladles. I don't think that these guys have actually made a well yet. I think that's the one thing I've been neglecting. Let's go ahead and put a well over there in kind of this area of town. 
Uh, did those get done right there? Because I wanted to show you how the equipment works. So with the equipment here, when you click on their equipment slots, it basically opens up a colony-wide... It opens up like a colony-wide inventory, and then you just click and drag like Diablo-style, basically. So there's the sword right there, and then there is the heater shield. There we go. And what you will see is that she will go off from training now, and she will go pick those things up from the stockpile. But we're running out of time for the day, so my name is Splattercat, and this game is called Odd Realm. I think this is one of those sleeper colony survival games that's very, very much under the radar. Like, I never hear about anybody talking about it or referencing it. And that's largely due to the fact that between, like, Dwarf Fortress and RimWorld, a lot of the air has been sucked out of the room. But there are people doing interesting things with the formula. Uh, like, this right here is basically like a hyper-smoothed-out version of Nomoria, where it still retains a lot of that gritty micromanagement, but it kind of packages it in a very, very slick graphical veneer that looks very high-quality and very nice, assuming that you're into pixel art. And, like, the storyline narrative elements that they've co-opted from RimWorld with, like, the random events that happen on your map, like an invasion of cats or whatever, are also very, very cool. And so you've got something that's very much in between the two points of Dwarf Fortress and RimWorld that kind of borrows liberally from both in order to get it to, like, a center point. Uh, where it's not entirely focused on kind of, like, the AI narrative but it's not entirely focused on nitty-gritty managing lists of dwarves and, like, what they're up to and what they're doing and, and you know, in ASCII and everything else, too. And, and so I think that's a pretty cool place for the game to be. You've also got games like Songs of Six that are taking it like a total war direction where it's RimWorld, but you have 2,500 colonists, and you can arrange them into phalanxes and fight with your neighbors in giant total war-style battles, too. Uh, but anyways, it's cool to see these ideas come on out, and I, I think that the developer of this game has made a solid product. I would like to see, you know, new content coming out for it pretty soon, but it seems like we're getting to that phase of development where all of the technical stuff has been mostly sorted out and everything's running smoothly. I haven't had any problems with colonists getting confused or getting stuck or not knowing what activities to do or bugging out. And that's been in four or five hours. And I have had some tricky situations with regards to, like, the Z-levels and mining and whatnot that I've been keeping an eye on to see if it trips up the AI. And it all seems to function pretty smoothly. Like, the AI seems to be arranged really, really well. And that's a big problem that run into, the people run into with games like this. Like, I know that uh, if you guys ever played Stonehearth, that was a game that was completely undone by the fact that they just couldn't get their AI to navigate complex... Uh, nav meshes properly like that entire game ground to a standstill because of it and so don't think that I'm bringing this up for no reason like that's a very very important part of the implementation of a game like this is like how under what stresses will the AI eventually just sit there with question marks over their head and break and not know what to do till they starve to death and I haven't seen any situations or contingencies like that while I've been playing this game uh, they install roofs very very well I know that you guys have thought it was funny that I pointed out that the make or break thing for a lot of colony builders is how they install roofs. Uh, they install roofs perfectly fine. Everything goes great. Uh, all of the automated features like draw water when you have less than this amount, make meals when you have less than this amount, uh, they all seem to work great. And so honestly, I think this game has a big and bright future ahead of it. I just, I really, really want more content. That's pretty much it. I want the new races. I want all the new stuff going on and I'm looking forward to it. Oh yeah. And I did want to admit before we do the outro here, I figured out how you manage areas. You right-click on them in the stock. So basically, I'll show you it so that you don't trip over the same thing I did for the last couple hours. Uh, here's what you do. You go to the rooms menu right here. It's going to give you a list of all of the rooms that you have in your colony. And this is exactly the menu I was talking about earlier in the video that I must have just missed. And I just tripped upon it while I was doing the outro. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll add that onto the end of the video so that people know and they don't get stuck on it like I did. If you wanted to manage, you right click on these and it'll allow you to set up custom categories and whatnot for basically your stockpiles or your farms, that kind of stuff. So I did find it. Good stuff. My name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to. Today up on the chopping block, we had Odd Realm. Tomorrow we will have something else. Thank you for sharing your time with me. I know that uh, free time is a luxury that not a lot of us get a ton of, and so spending it with me is definitely appreciated. I will see you all tomorrow with something hot and fresh off the indie skillet, but up until then, I think it's time for me to go. Thanks for hanging out, and that's all I got. Bye, everybody.